Uh, aloha. <clears throat> so um, I'm Naoto Weno. I'm the new Cancer Center Director, started in December, and I'm going to talk about cancer survivorship, but focusing on patient empowerment. So let me actually start from my story, okay? So I have experienced cancer twice, okay? So one is called sarcoma, which is basically a soft tissue cancer on the left side. So <clears throat> I removed my left thigh's uh, tissue, and so that's one. The second is it's called myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a, a, like a leukemia. Uh, this is a, a non-curable disease technically technically at this moment. Uh, so there's two paths. You get treatment and you die slowly without taking the risk, or you could do a stem cell transplant, which is really uh, swapping out somebody else's immune system, blood system, and getting a new system. And there was a chance of dying probably like in 30% in the first year. Now, whether you call 30% high or low, that's up to you or up to me. But to me, it was high, but uh, I wanted to live with a fullest extent. The question to a part of the aging is, you know, what, how do you want to live, right? And then how you want to live actually impact as, as a patient. Of course, if you're completely healthy, that's fine. But for me to live well, I have to take this risk, and so I went through transplant five years ago, so here I am. Thank you. So I'm going to, at the end of conclusion, I'll tell you the do and don't, and, uh, and ultimately this is about, you know, uh, it, it's, I'm going to be talking about cancer mostly, but it doesn't matter if it's cancer or not. So. High quality medical care provides patients with a high satisf satisfactory medical care delivery and can live their live in their own way. So that's what we want, right? And that's what the physician wants. But there is a discrepancy between what healthcare provider and you as on the receiving end of what it means. So you go to hospital, you go to Queens, uh, Hawaii, Pacific Health, you know, you go to your doctor, okay, uh, you know, there's many different healthcare systems. Uh, ultimately, particularly like cancer care is evolving re very rapidly. So, you know, probably 30 years ago, when I started as a physician, you could just say, hey, you pick your best doctor and you'll be okay. Well, that is completely over. Uh, every care that you're taking will require what we call multidisciplinary care. It's a team approach. It's not even the doctors is gonna be driving your care, the nurses and pharmacists. Particularly cancer is very complicated, more than complicated than any other disease, and it impacts so many people because we're all afraid of cancer, including myself. So team approach, multidisciplinary care, is behind you, and you're actually part of that team. And that's a very difficult sense to get. So what is team approach? Okay, so team approach is coordinated treatment and caretaking into account patients' needs. So think about your doctors, okay. Are you getting by one doctor, or are you getting by multiple doctors, or are you getting from different people? Who is on, on your team? Do you know only the doctor? And that I see as a problem because you need to know the entire team because there, everything is a moving elements that provides a care. We make our clinical decision based on scientific evidence. But you have to remember that in medicine there are things that doesn't have a lot of med, you know, evidence. So we have to get a consensus. So meaning that we discuss, okay? and they discuss behind your back. <laughs> That's a, not a great expression, but it's a reality, okay? So if you don't have the right team, the discussion ends up being like one doctor say, hey, I want you to do that type of approach. That's not really good. So 
really, you know, clinical decision or multidisciplinary care really depends on the right team members. So collaboration, and then if it doesn't work, our job as a healthcare provider is to disseminate the information. So high quality physician will disseminate information. I'm not talking about just simply research. Uh, is your doctor simply just seeing the patient or is he or she disseminating information? And that's how I decide the quality of the care. Because if you're just gonna practice and you know, charge and make money, it's like, you know, you may be getting the care from 30 years ago. You want people to engage in what's going on in the real world, and you want to, to get the latest treatment. So the, ultimately, the goal of multidisciplinary care is patient satisfaction. So what is your satisfaction, right? And if I ask, you know, about whatever disease and your satisfaction, everybody will answer differently. So therefore, if you provide your ultimate goal to your one doctor, it's a bias. So that's one of the reasons for, from our end, doctor, nurses, pharmacists, and other healthcare provider wants to know where you want to go. And even if they don't want to know, it is your job to tell them. Because if you don't tell them, we assume that this is what you want. It's like going to sushi restaurant, okay? If you don't know the taste of the sushi, I could give you any kind of fish and you won't be able to tell it's good or bad, actually. But if you're a good consumer and you know what you're getting, okay, the chef will pay attention. And that's the game that you're playing with, with us. So our goal, when I say our, is from our end as a physician or healthcare provider is providing high quality of care, improving your quality of care, and empowering the patient, which is you, okay? Or even you don't have to have a disease, but empowering the, the non-healthcare provider. And then for us, we don't want to burn out. You know how many doctors are burned out in the United States? It's about 70%. Some people say that that was the number that was given pre-pandemic. And after pandemic, there's even, you know, coming alarming trend. You don't want doctors or healthcare providers to burn out because if they're burned out, the care quality will go down. And this is one of the reasons that we need to have a better care with more investment in this area. So ultimately, multidisciplinary care brings into patient-centered care and improves outcome and safety. And then for us, it's ultimately about improving the satisfaction of the patient and satisfaction of the doctors. So if you watch a movie, you know, you probably watch all of like these doctors' movie and they're like sleepy and they can't wake up. That's a bad care, actually. I just want you to let you know. You don't want a burnout doctor, okay? But you don't want a doctor just on the beach and not doing anything also, right? So both, it's a, it's a matter of balance. And this is what, you know, the medical school, including cancer care, all the healthcare system is paying attention. So patient satisfaction, what is it? Well, it's a, for you, it probably it's improving your health or improving of your disease, okay? But... We, I could give you any kind of cancer treatment, but I could give you tons of side effects. You may say that it's my job to prevent side effects. Yes, it is my job, but sometimes there's no way to prevent it. And so quality of life is important. What do you want? If I don't know what you want, I will give what's actually written on the cookbook. So high quality of life is what is it, okay? And then ultimately, it's of course, you know, we want the best outcome. And I told you that I decided to pick stem cell transplant despite of 30% risk. The question is, did you make that decision and are you understanding the process? You don't want to go to the doctor and say, doc, just take care of me. That is ultimately bad stuff, okay? If I hear that, it's a red flag for me if I hear that kind of stuff. You are in charge, and you have to tell us what you want. And then you have to show that your understanding 
you know, going, do you understand what you're taking? So you don't want to go to the doctor and say, like, doctor asks you, okay, what medication are you taking? Well, that red drugs, and, you know, I don't remember the name. Oh, my God, that's like a red flag all over my brain. That's what I'm looking at it. Okay, and if I ask you what disease you have or history, you can't even say your history. Oh, just ask your daughter. So it's like, daughter, you're asking. You don't know, and you want your daughter to take over your life. That's the kind of a thing I want you to understand. Now, I have to admit that some doctor doesn't care about this. Read, really, you know, I'm just going to tell you. Some healthcare provider, you know, if you don't speak up, I'm going to tell you it's the easiest. If I'm a sushi chef and you don't care about the quality, oh my God, it's, it's, life is easy for me. I could just get the lowest quality and then I could charge you whatever you want. So that's not what you want. It's a balance and that's why you're part of the team and you should demand and you're the consumer. It's like buying a car. If you buy your car, you're, you don't behave that way, right? You're going to go to the dealer and you have an attitude. Some, somehow, you, you know, suddenly you become your attitude completely changed. You negotiate. You want the best car you want, this equipment, A, B, C, D. Same thing. That's the approach you should take. Okay, so the patient is in that. So like cancer care, as I said, is multiple thing. Hawaii has a challenge because we, you know, we have multiple healthcare system. We have many private practitioner. One of our goal of cancer center is to streamline this process academically, networking with medical school to provide a, a much more streamlined care is what we're looking for with working with the healthcare system. But because you don't have MD Anderson, you don't have Memorial Sloan Kettering, you don't have UCLA, it's not a one-stop shop here. You have to coordinate your care. And ultimately, of course, if we could coordinate everything, that's our goal, but that's not what we have. So we're in the transition situation. So you have to be further trying to figure out who is your team and how do you get your best care. Now, this applies not just for cancer, all diseases. One shop, shop stop, you know, one place to go and do everything it's not easy. Even getting a second opinion is very difficult here because you have only 1.4 million people. You have limited number of doctors. It's, you know, the doctors are all friends, actually. <laughs> right? So, so your goal is to try to figure out to how to get that care. So we're going to talk about patient empowerment. This is actually my patient, actually. I got a permission to take. She's a young lady in her early 40s, and she had metastatic breast cancer. She died several years ago. I see her as my, you know, mentor as a patient. So remember, I was a patient. Even as a physician, we're not ready for tough disease such as cancer. Uh, health, you know, when you have a health crisis, it, it, it doesn't have to be cancer, as I said. When you have a crisis, the question is, how do you actually get mentoring from other? And it really comes from either your family caregiver or your you know, peers. And why do I respect her so much? Because she actually knew how to deal with a healthcare provider, despite that I'm the healthcare provider and she's my patient. You know, our visit was sometimes I talked to her about her care but she advised me how I should behave as a patient. So that's where we want to really for you to find out, okay? And I can't give you one approach, but I want you to give you some, I'm trying to give you an essence for to think about, well, as a patient, what do you want to do? So what is empowerment? So empowerment is defined by a World Health Organization. It's a process which people gain greater control over decision and action affect, affecting their health. It's about you, okay? And then, so you have to understand what is your role, right? In you're in Hawaii, you're in Oahu, you know, who's your team? What's your role, okay? Don't say, I'm just a simple patient. No, you're part of the team. You want to improve your care. You know, acquisition of patient of sufficient knowledge. Do you have enough knowledge about your disease? Okay. And, uh, and are you able to do a catch ball with me? If you have no knowledge, 
it's not possible, right? It's like, you know, I, I try to explain and you don't try to understand or you're not willing to learn or I'm explaining in a way that I don't, you don't even understand and you're just nodding your head all the time and then thank you and mahalo and bye, you know. And then later on, it's like, what that doctor is telling you? I don't even understand what he said, actually. Well, that's a terrible visit, actually. It, does that happen to me? Yes, it happens. And sometimes it happens not because of your knowledge, simply because you're in panic or you're overall too much information, right? And the doctor loves to use like all these, you know, stuff that nobody understands. And so, so, so that's the issue. And then it's about patient skills, uh, what kind of skill you need to engage. And uh, you, we need to have that facilitating environment, which needs to come from us. Okay. So... What is patient competence? It's actually uh, accepting his her illness as his own. So you have to own your disease, okay? And not leaving it to the healthcare provider. You are the owner of the disease. We are not owner of the disease. Your disease is part of your body, and it's your journey, actually. You can't get rid of it. So cancer is a tough one because... A lot of people say that, hey, breast cancer, take it out and give treatment and you'll be in. Yes, unfortunately, these tough disease, there is no end of journey. And it's always stay with you, even heart attack, stroke. It's your history, okay? So um, you want to, you know, gain knowledge, okay? And then be, build relationship with trust, okay, with communication with healthcare provider. Okay, so this is about gaining leadership in your life, even if you have cancer, okay? So a lot of people, when you have cancer, they want to make cancer the center of your life. Or if you have a serious disease, okay? That's not the reason you're living or you're alive, right? You're alive because you do what you want to do or you want to interact with your family or kids or you know, whatever that is, or friends, So regardless of your health status, it's important that you take the lead. Now, the doctors, healthcare provider, does not know how you live at home. We have no idea. There's some data to suggest that we only know about 2 to 4% of what's going on at home. And we don't know because, one, we don't have time to ask you all the questions what you're doing at home. Second, you don't tell me, so I have no idea, right? And third, a lot of time, you know, our focus is just providing, you know, treatment so, or diagnostic, so it's not a high priority. But that could change, depend on how you approach us, actually. You're in charge. If you tell us what's going on at home, how you see yourself getting these treatment, and what is your expectation, it's an aha moment for us, actually. Okay. So people who have low patient empowerment, okay, as a patient, they usually don't ask questions, okay? Or they don't even know what to ask the doctors, okay? Um, and they generally do not know their illness. If I ask a question, they don't know. I'm going to tell you. They don't know. You won't believe it. We have so many patients who don't know even sometimes why they're getting this treatment, why they're getting chemo. It happens. And then they love to go to Google. Okay. They love to search. And they love to pick fake news real fast. So low health literacy. And, 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 and despite of that, they love to leave it to us. Please take care of me. Okay, so this is uh, Everest thought of uh, something like this. Okay, so this is a conversation. It happens in sometimes, and I'm exaggerating this. This is a healthcare term. Mr. A, he's not very good at understand his patient or Mrs. A. Okay, um, Mr. B went to alternative medicine, but there is no other way to help him. Okay. And then Mr. C, always leave it up to the medical profession, but I really wonder if that's the right things to do. Okay. 
And then we say, crap, this is a patient that we're dealing with. That's the behind the talk that happens with us. We, we love empower patient. If you're not empowered, we're like, you know, shaking our heads like back here. like, oh, my God, you know, where did she get this information? How, why did she they didn't talk to us? And why did she start it? She bought a $500 some kind of energy juice to cure cancer or something like that. So, so for, from our end, you know, we want to engage more. So, yes, there's some push from our end that we want to be more active, involved with a patient. But it's also for you to be involved. So here's how you identify, you know, uh, doctors who have issues. Basically, I'm telling you, it's a bad doctor, okay? Um, so if they're focused on their only expertise and they don't seem to care about your quality of life or they don't encourage questions, you know, there's a concern, okay? He, you know, so you could figure that by the conversation. You could think about, you know, doctors about this. And then does she really, does the doctor or the provider really know who you are? And if they don't even know at this stage, after like two years of whatever communication, there's an issue here. Now, of course, you know, high-skilled person is always fantastic. I'm, I'm not denying about that. But ultimately, it's about satisfaction. Healthcare provider cannot guarantee an outcome. We want you to get the best outcome, but we cannot guarantee it. A lot of doc- patients tell us that they want the best outcome and they want us to guarantee, and we're shaking our head, actually, because we can't guarantee it. Disease outcome is part natural history, but whether you regret in your care or not really depends on how much you're understanding. So low patient empowerment outcome, okay, which could be a fault of the healthcare provider or uh, us, could decline quality of healthcare. It's a compliance issue. Generally, uh, they will not take the medicine we try to take you. You know, we're always paying attention to your prescription, and they, you know, suddenly that your prescription, you know, refill should be coming three months, but you come in five months. That's a red flag for us. It's probably you're not taking it, okay? And then there's a medical error, and if something is wrong happening, of course the error is our responsibility, but commonly patient engagement is low. Mistake happens because a patient is not engaged. We make mistakes. And it is your job to tell that, hey, doc, you know, your documentation is wrong. Or, you know, this doesn't make sense. Okay, is this right? Okay. Um, You know, I get that all the time, actually. And I make a mistake. But I don't make a mistake to the point to the next level. But if doctor doesn't care, and if you don't care, yes, malpractice could happen. And, um, and this could foster, you know, if you don't engage, you could be spreading fake information to the other patients, okay? And then the delayed overall scientific progress goes down. So high patient empowerment result in you'll be willing to ask questions, understand where they stand in disease process, have a high level of health literacy, and participate in care and treatment. And ultimately, they will be even participating in clinical trials. Cancer, we made a lot of progress since the 70s after Nixon's Cancer Act, but still our standard care is not the best. So how do we improve the outcome for you or for everybody is to participate in clinical trials. If you are thinking clinical trials as an experimental treatment, I'm going to say absolutely that's a wrong approach. So, but to, for you to feel that way, it's about knowledge. Does your pay, you know, physician empower you? Do you feel empowered or not? So patient does need to learn patient empowerment process. So what is a kind of a skill that you could have? It's called the MAC, okay? Medical literacy, assertiveness, and communication. These are skills, okay? You need to know how to read, like, uh, the, how to use Google. Medical literacy is very important. So let's talk about the, you know, 
the patient needs is I want the content to be easy to understand or I want to understand the content. So what healthcare providers should do is combine tech, you know, try to reduce the technical terms, use notes and diagram. So the opposite thing is for you to ask, stop saying that word, doc, I don't understand. Don't nod your head if you don't understand. You should say it. Don't let that person keep going. Use, t- take a piece of paper and explain me by a figure. It, it is your right to ask these things, okay? Um, you could, um, exp- you know, you could also ask for explanation. So the common thing we do as a physician to you is, you know, what did I talk last week? And then if you can't explain it, that means that you're not understanding. So if you go to a doctor, you could come back home, you could test this with your family. My doctor said, in this silent moment, and don't remember, that means that you're pretty much not understanding. So what are you going to do? Well, bring your family, you know, you could record the conversation, right? Don't, don't secretly record. That doesn't go very well, okay? <laughs> it has happened. Um, sometimes they like to take videos these days, and then uh, <laughs> it's a little bit, <laughs> I, I allow them, but yes. So, but these, there are things you could do, okay? So medical literacy is about ability to find good stuff and ability to determine the truth. It is your right to go to Google, whatever, you know, look it up, okay? Internet is wonderful places, but there's a lot of negative things. So I want you to understand that every information has benefit and risk. So I could tell you that if information said no side effect, works perfectly well, okay? That means it's fake, period. <laughs> okay, such a thing doesn't exist, okay? Uh, uh, additional, info, uh, additional treatment for your doctor, you know, uh, Western medicine. Uh, and, and if you're charging like a couple hundred dollars, that's usually a fake, actually. If it's really that good, okay, we will be approving this, and it will be on market, and we will be prescribing it, okay? So how do you define the evidence? Uh, Dr. Kamau, I still have time, right? Okay. Uh, how do you define the evidence? Okay, so there's high quality and low quality. Okay, so let me explain easy way to define it. Okay. If your doctor says, according to my experience, this is wonderful, that is low-level evidence. <laughs> okay. You should also... Yes. It's, it, it's, okay, I'm not going to always say it's a low-level evidence, but my experience is extremely concerning to me, okay? Rather, you should, you should hear like, okay, based on this randomized clinical trials or rate this paper and guideline of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, this is considered the best treatment. It's probably more insuring. Now, of course, guideline and literature, they don't always have information. So sometimes we do say that based on this information, we still have to use my experience. But if your communication is all based on, based on my experience, my population, that's a biased information. So I want you to understand that when you go to your Google, there's from high-level evidence from low-level evidence, like National Cancer Institute or every disease, they have a society guideline. Those are generally high. But... Uh, you know, patient A, one experience, did very well with taking this um, mushroom, okay? That, that's, you know, you know, I feel like, even myself, I feel like I want to jump on this, but you shouldn't. And if you really want to do it, print it out, take it to your doctor. Doc, I saw this. What do you think about it? Don't just, you know, try to digest the information by yourself. The other is uh, net literacy, okay? Um, so a lot of time we use like a, a very casual way like breast cancer and then, uh, and, or even let's say there's a drug called Taxol, right? Chemotherapy, right? But every drug have what we call the generic name and product name. So Taxol is a product name. Generic name is Paclitaxel. 
So when you do your literature search, you want to do a search with both, both words because by putting this generic name, sometimes you get more information than the product name because you have to remember for us, healthcare provider, we do not like to use product name because we're trying to reduce commercial bias on our practice as much as we can. Uh, get educated in how to you know, bet the online information, obtain information. So if you really want to look up something, you could go to your doctor and say, you know, what do you, which, which site do you think is the best? And usually I give them all the things. Or, you know, share the site information. I, don't print out 30 pages and bring it to your doctor. We will not read it, okay? But the, just by reading the first page, most healthcare provider could tell you that this is a reasonable site or not a reasonable site. So the MAC assertiveness. Assertiveness is about expressing your thoughts and feelings. So patient needs is, I want to choose my treatment, or I want to tell you what I want, okay? What healthcare pro- professionals should do is not just opinion, but a preferred option and to be or not to be standard. So what I mean by is that sometimes that some doctor will say, would you like to treat between, choose between A and B, okay? That is probably, a, to me, a, a red flag as a healthcare provider. There is no A or B. So usually we have a preferred choices. So try to figure out what the doctor wants and then find out why you want it. But when we give a preferred choice of treatment to you, we could do this if you tell us what you want in your treatment. So if you say that, okay, I have to go to work you know, every day, I don't have time, and it's really difficult to break you know, my time, that would make me think maybe I should choose B instead of A. But if you don't say anything, we will just do whatever we want to do. So not knowing about you has an impact of treatment, particularly in cancer, that have a tendency. If, you, if the doctor asks, this is the treatment for you, you should ask, uh, is this a really a standard treatment that's based on the U.S. guideline? And if they say yes, that means it's good. If they say no, you should ask why it is not. And they have a reason usually. Okay, no is not mean it's bad. Every treatment, generally we follow the guideline. But if it's a no, you want to know why your doctor is choosing this. Because what happened is that you go home and say, okay, I look it up and it's like, oh, you know, this is not standard. Why am I getting this? This happens all the time. But you didn't ask that question, okay? So I want to tell you what I want really comes from, of course, you could say what I want, but it comes from your value and your work history or your hobbies and all your life. So these are important information to share with the doctors. So, of course, we need to pay attention to it, but that's why some doctor doesn't care about you. And then it could happen because they're busy. Well, they care about you, but they may not have enough time to get into this. So it's your job to tell the doctor who you are, okay? I like to jog. I, like, I'm a, I used to be a librarian. I don't know what it is, okay? But I try to pay attention to what their hobby and what their occupation is because it gives you a lot of history of who you are. Okay, so communications. Okay, I don't, you don't, I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to worry. And I want to own what the doctor has told me, okay? So it's, there is no rush in anything. So if they say, next week you need to go for surgery for your breast cancer, something is not right, okay? In most cancer, there is no rush. This is not a heart attack. There are certain cancers like leukemia and lymphoma we should rush, but most time, there's plenty of time. So take a deep breath, and if the doctor is just watching the computer, do not mess with it. Uh, uh, tell them that watch, look my eye. Don't look the computer, okay? You're laughing, but that means it's happening, actually. Okay. They should be watching your eye, not the computer. Okay. Um, you could record, and, and, um, um, and I highly recommend to bring your companion. Okay. Okay. So we talked about empowerment already, 
And these are the skills that I want you to see that you have. Do you have the medical literacy skill? Are you assertive to your doctor? Do you have the communication skill? It takes a lot of training. Even if I tell you, it just doesn't happen. I could not do it, period. I'm just going to let you know, okay? If when I had this uh, serious situation, yes, I will look up in literature. I got this supplement, and it looks like it's very attractive. I even order it, actually. And then, you know, and my patient have to tell me that, doc, you need to stop doing that type of thing. It happens. We're human being, right? So, so that's where coaching comes. That's where the healthcare provider or your peer could help. But I want you to recognize these elements are very important, okay? But we need this nice environment, right? So that's why you come to this, like, mini medical school, get to know each other. Or if you have a certain disease, join the patient advocacy group or try to find out who's your peer. These are all the elements that makes a difference in your care. So facilitating envi- environment is important. Somehow it didn't come out. Oh, here it is. So these are coming from eye contact, you know, and then you have to smile. You have to smile. We have to smile, okay? Uh, offer hand, okay? Warm word of encouragement and take it all in and then a deep insight and reflections, okay? Uh, it goes on both ends. If I have a, you know, if you come and show only anger. You could show your anger and emotion to the healthcare provider. But if you leave the clinic only with ang- anger, okay, it makes us really nervous, actually. It really deteriorates the, our relationship. You have to remember, okay, we are, ser- you know, we're basically a service industry. I agree with that. But we are not hotel industry. We're not going to keep smiling. If you're just going to scream and yell at us all constantly, it, we, won't, we will continue to give you the, the right treatment, but the extra step that you need may not happen because we're, we will get nervous and we will end up doing defensive medicine. So your attitude has an impact to us. So you should smile even with the, you know, the most difficult situation. Something to think about. Okay, so this is about what we're talking about, empathy. Empathy to us, to you, empathy to the healthcare provider. Okay, and ability to understand the patient's internal expression, thoughts, and concerns. Okay, so the higher, there's some data, the higher the primary physician empathy score, the better the patient's clinical outcome. So what I'm trying to tell you is medicine is not simply about your knowledge and expertise. Uh, you know, going to MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, these are nice. They give you highest quality. I'm from MD Anderson, okay? I think it's one of the best hospitals. But that's not the determining factor of patient satisfaction. You have wonderful healthcare system. It's just a matter of your engagement. It is our responsibility to even give you a better care. Okay. So patient has a value. Okay, there is evidence, and then we have our expertise, okay? But this is, this element actually gets better with your max skill, medical literacy, assertiveness, and communications, okay? And this is the environment that we have to foster. Uh, it takes all of us. It takes the ohana. It's a family to make things happen, okay? So I talked about evidence, right? So literacy... You know, it's our job. You're not, it's not your job to create evidence. It is our job to provide you the highest level of care. That's our job, the cancer care job, medical school job, multidisciplinary care, health care, and us, that's our job. But patient competence, which is the third pillar of the health care, it's you and me's responsibility. And this is what I mean by you're part of the team. Don't just expect that we're just going to be okay. The healthcare is so complex that without your engagement, you will not get the best care. So don't say, doc, whatever you like. That's really the worst thing to say to us. Okay. So for healthcare provider, we want to provide platform to learn and deepen the necessary knowledge of the skill related to patient empowerment. And then to the public, 
This is about you raising the awareness about the patient competence and patient empowerment process. So I talked about you. So now you have this knowledge. You're empowered. So your job is to practice, but your other job is to spread the word to your family and everybody. And particularly for your kids, grandkids, you want to get, gain this patient competency not because you have the cancer or stroke. You, this is about gaining this knowledge when you are very, very young, okay? And that is a win because you want to get the highest prevention, okay? You don't want to get, you want to be healthy. And that's how you empower, and that's the greatest gift that you could give to the next generation. So this program, you know, the presentation, I, the reason I give you this talk is part one, survivorship, but I started this patient empowerment program in Japan. So we, we've been working on this uh, not just educating uh, the patient, but we were trying to change the healthcare provider to really think about patient empowerment. So patient competence referred to the attitude of the patient, okay? And then we talk about the three important skills, and we or you should empower the patient. It doesn't have to be cancer. Through facilitating with empathy, okay? So I want to finish with this. I think most of you probably were not re able to read. Okay. <laughs> However, I, I, I could read. And then, uh, so I'll explain about win. So there's a word win. Okay. Win is in Japanese called katsu. Okay. Katsu is win. Okay. But there are two types of win in Japanese word. Okay. The first win is like, you know, like playing the game or baseball and you win. But the other word, katsu, means that you overcome the difficulty about yourself. So healthcare and health is about winning over yourself, self-control. So I want you to win, but I don't mean win by just winning the disease or winning what you're trying to do. You win about how you want to approach your life, and that's what will bring you the better care. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Sorry for speaking a long time. No, 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 not at all. Thank you, Dr. Ueno. Uh, do we have any questions from our audience? Oh, we have several. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I've really never heard it talked about from this angle before. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are about physician's assistance. For example, I have an appointment with the doctor, but I don't see the doctor. I see the physician's assistant, who, when I ask certain questions, can't really answer the questions. And when I ask when I'm going to see the doctor, the physician's assistant just says to me, well, the doctor's going to decide when you get to see the doctor and when you get to see me, and I won't find out until I actually have the appointment. And the doctor's not there. It's the physician's assistant. And I notice that these physician's assistants are becoming utilized more and I don't really know what their background is. I mean, they're not a doctor, right? So I, I right. just would like to hear your so comments. Thank I you. Say, right, so that's an interesting question. So we're talking about different type of uh, healthcare as a part of the team, right? So one is a physician assistant, the other one is a nurse practitioner, the other one is like clinical farm D. Okay, these are the three areas that's really to show up uh, more than Hawaii and like in the mainland, you see these people. So the question is, who are they actually? Well, they're part of the team that we just talked about. Now, the issue is, how are they really framed in that you know, clinic or whatever the area that you're in actually? And so this is where we recognize as an issue because some people they use these like physician assistant or nurse practitioner as just as a, 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 a try to get the workload done. And if you face that kind of person, then if you get those cares, 
you will not get the answer that you want to see or you will get very concerned. But if the physicians are really empowering that nurse practitioner or physician assistant, they generally could represent very similar to what that doctor is thinking. So, so I'm not answering your question, but you're right. It, this is where the, the tough situation is. I would like to say that there are a lot of good PAs and a lot of good nurse practitioner, but there's also that there are nurse practitioner and, and PA who are not empowered enough. So as a patient, when you go in, you don't feel like you're getting what you want. So you're going to have to really look from that angle and decide whether that's the person you want to deal with it. And if you're not satisfied with it, then you're going to have to demand that I just want to see the, the doctor for essential thing, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from our Thank online you. audience. We have often heard that Hawaii could become a center for medical tourism. Is there any chance that we will ever get a major MD Anderson or Mayo type center here in Hawaii? That's our cancer center. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so just from the cancer perspective, uh, the Cancer Center is trying to transform now to really establish an expert disease-oriented expertise, and we are trying to work with a healthcare system to have a much more streamlined access. I'm not going to say we have it at this moment. Uh, our uh, goal, okay, it's just a goal at this moment, and is to make sure that you don't have to leave the island, and we could provide the highest quality of care, seamless multidisciplinary care, and also providing clinical trials. That said, still, because of this is an underserved area and resource depletion, there are areas that you will still have to go to the West Coast or other major cancer center. But I think the cancer center job is to triage that, uh, that component so that, uh, like you say, um, we try to, we want you to stay. Now, medical tourism and providing best care is a two different thing, right? So um, I think the first is to address the state of Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. And from there, uh, I think there is an opportunity to do a medical tourism because of our connection to many Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, this might tie into what you just said right now, but in the case of cancer for the patient, how do you determine who your lead oncologist or healthcare provider should be? For example, let's say your primary care doctor is affiliated with Queens. He or she may want to have you see Queens people. Um, and how do you know that's really the right person? Who, who can help you decide that? And also, then how do you decide whether maybe you're not that comfortable with the options here and decide that I need to go to the mainland for treatment? I think that's an, it's overwhelming when somebody is diagnosed with a disease like this. You know, how do you decide? Right. So you will have to ask this question that, Okay, you know, doing the care, there is always a potentially a primary lead needed, right? So, so let's, I'm just going to use breast cancer as an example, okay? So breast cancer requires surgery, uh, medical surgeon, medical oncologist, and radiation oncologist. Usually the primary lead depends on uh, the phase of the treatment. So if it's surgery, then the surgeon will take the lead, and then they'll pass the baton. But this is actually, you need, that, the question needs to be asked. I mean, technically, we should be explaining to you that exactly how this is a flow and who is in charge on that time. Now, if they're not ex explaining it, then there's a deficiency there. And it, it is your, I think you need to ask that, who is the lead? Now, in terms of whether this needs to go to the mainland or not, really, it's a question that uh, you need to, ask that particular question at this moment. Because currently, um, there are cancer center academic physicians, like in breast, that uh, 
the, who really could help in terms of whether this should go to the mainland or not. So does that kind of doctor exist on the island? The answer is yes. Do we have a number? The answer is no. Uh, and uh, are we going to increase that number over the several years? The answer is yes. So that's like you just said. I'm not you know, able to do this now, but that's what we're going to be seeing over the several years if I don't get fired is what, is <laughs> what I'm going to say. It is challenging because I need your help. I need your really push to demand that, uh, that we cancer center or working with healthcare that we want a better care. That's the demand. I, it needs to come from the patient because I'm trying to push this and your request is going to make a difference in terms of how fast we could change. Because, you know, there's always, like, um, it takes a long time to change, right? But uh, we want to speed that, uh, make it speed, but it, uh, speed up the things. And I want to do it, but it, if I don't have any support, it won't happen that fast, actually. Patient empowerment is a good ideal, but... Oh, there are limitations that I find. That is the availability of specialists. Some don't take new patients. Some you have to wait three months as opposed to two months and stuff like that. But also I was wondering the limitation of what insurance will cover, what Medicare will cover that determines what I can afford and where I can go. Could you address the role of the insurance? Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be in the position to address the fi financial aspect, but the patient empowerment, still I will go back to it because, okay, if you are a very empowered patient and with your current existing doctor, if you are really picky and then you're, you know, ask start questions, it will alert that doctors or the provider real fast. So you could actually improve the quality of the care simply by demanding. It's, a, it's the same thing I talk about the sushi restaurant, okay? If you demand as a consumer, it does have an impact to us. If you don't demand, it's easy for us, actually. So, so unfortunately, somehow, there is this, like, you know, you know healthcare providers up there and then the patients over here. It is, we, we don't feel that way, but it, it does exist. So I want you to, you know, I, I don't want you to fight with a healthcare provider, okay? I want you to simply start asking questions, okay? And show your smartness. And that really alerts us. And then, uh, so even the doctors that who was like, you know, wasn't really engaged, suddenly they will start to change depending on how you are. Because I'll tell you that we do talk, you know, you know, our room say like, oh my God, this patient has this and this and this. And then, you know, oh, I really need to learn more and I need to be well, well prepared for this patient. Mm -hmm. do, I, we, do we have this conversation? Yes, we do have this conversation. Mm -hmm. so, so your attitude has an impact. So, so I can't fix a finance, but there's many things you could do. I have a comment and a question, and I'm sorry the person had such a terrible experience with the PA, and I just want to do a shout out to all the wonderful PAs yeah. and nurse practitioners, right. because in my experience, the doctors are so busy, those people actually spend more time and more quality time with me, and one of the experiences I had, the um, PA was so honest and said, I don't have the answer, and went to the physician during my appointment and got it. So I think it saved a lot of excellent physicians on island that would have been worked to death without those people. And my question is, I saw on your side slide that on the team, which I strongly believe in a team approach and have worked as part of a team. Are there really case managers and social workers on the teams, or is it all rolled up into one person? 
you mean are they really engaged in the part of the team? Is that what you're asking? Or? Well, well, I saw you have a case manager and a social worker. Mm -hmm. It looked like on the slide. But I'm thinking the social worker does the role of the case manager? Uh, it depends on the hospital, how the case manager and social worker is defined. Okay, so that slide really comes from like a large cancer center. And then, uh, so, the, so if you go to a mega cancer center, they will be paying attention to every financial component. And the social worker doesn't do that. Social worker is gonna be paying attention to more of, you know, in terms of what's happening at home and what is a resource missing that would allow to give a, the best care. And even issues at home, we will try to address. But if you don't have it, then they will have to do all above type yeah. of thing. I just wonder, because I've done some work with Kaiser, mm -hmm. Straub, all, uh, various medical facilities here, but I had the same experience in the mainland that the case manager did everything. Right. Dep so it's, I think it depends on how you define it. So yeah. I think you're right. And also thank you for mentioning about the PA and the APP. It, once again, they're, you know, I, I mean, I like them and it's very, you know, useful, but once again, each case is different. Most of them are quite good, but I think it will be nice to know. Okay, so here's what I do, what I used to do. When I work with my nurse practitioner, when I introduce them, I just explain in details what their role is, actually. Mm -hmm. And you explain and how it goes. So I will generally say that, you know, my trusted you know, nurse practitioner, and she will be engaged, and she'll be doing this and that. And yes, you know, she'll be communicating if it's necessary for this part. So they, this is framed very clearly. That's what I try to do. But if you don't frame it correctly, it's a very difficult what their role is because this complaint about what is they doing is, uh, is generally stems from our end that we, we haven't explained what their role is actually. Because suddenly you come in with a, I expect to see Dr. Weno and, and, you know, and then the nurse practitioner shows up, uh, the question happens, these type of questions happen. So I, I think it's part of our, you know, our responsibility how we frame this care. I have an online question. Uh, do you think better care will come from our current approach of treating disease, or should we refocus medical care by addressing the causes of disabilities through clinical trials and research? Uh, maybe, okay, okay so, sorry. So I think, I think she's talking about the fact that our current approach is we treat disease, mm -hmm. rather than focusing on causes of disability through research and through clinical care? Uh, I, I agree with that. I mean, we could do a better job. In a, I mean, so there's no one thing that's really more important than the other is the reality of medicine, actually. Every component is very important. Um, so, so, so it is, okay, so many of our, like, a cancer, cancer agenda is defined by what's the, what is the latest, and then, uh, but it, it doesn't mean the other component is not important. And so there's different level because it is true that the federal level or at the cancer center, we prioritize things. And then if it's not on the priority list, like we're like, you know, saying it's not important. But truly from my end, it's all equal is the way I see it actually. Yeah. Thank you. I think we'll do two more questions. Just a quick thank you for uh, addressing the problem of the doctor in front of the computer. <laughs> uh, my husband was seeing an oncologist and um, he would sit with the computer in front of him with his back to my husband who was hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. And I always asked him to ask whether or not he could get a printout of their uh, session and my husband would not ask for it. Mm -hmm. And then when he finally did, because I couldn't say anything in front of my husband, he didn't want me to talk. He wanted me to be there, but not talk. <laughs> so uh, he, he just uh, didn't understand that unless he was facing my husband, my husband wasn't hearing. 
And I was hearing, but when we would get home and he'd say, uh, the doctor said to do so-and-so. And I said, no, the doctor said this. <laughs> and so there was a big disagreement about that. So how do you feel about handing a, a patient a summary of their visit? So that's a good question. It takes a team approach about you know understanding what exactly happened. So there's a couple things that I, when these things happen, uh, what I, okay. So one, if there's a disagreement when you go home and that happens, the physician needs to know that this is happening, actually. And then they need to reassess the entire environment, what's going on. Be- because if we're not told about this, that, okay, so... Yes, it is our job to make sure the patient understands. And like I said, usually when the patient comes again, I ask the same question. And uh, can you tell me what's your understanding? And if they can explain or they're saying different things, that's alarm. But a lot of doctors may not do that, right? So, so the key is that if you as a caregiver noticing that things are not understood, this information needs to be quickly shared with a team, actually. If they know it, then, then they could take a different approach when they see the, uh, the, the patient. If we don't hear anything, then they'll just practice the same way, actually. So I think that's probably the easiest way to fix this. Okay, last question. Well, as a cancer survivor and thriver, I certainly appreciate the okay. talk about patient empowerment. Mine was 27 years ago, and I needed to very quickly say, I'm the decision maker. I appreciate your expertise, but I will make the decisions. And I think that helped a lot. But a current frustration I have with here is a lot of the oncologists, as well as other physicians, are developing their own internal uh, electronic uh, message for us, electronic uh, record. And that's very frustrating because then it's not all on my chart and you can't get access to it, nor did other physicians have that information. So could you comment on that? Yes, big problem. Uh, the, as you know that there's a major EMR, like Epic or e, uh, Cerner type of things, and uh, information sharing is uh, a big problem and some are very good and some are not very good at all, and then we, you know, even myself, I don't know what's going on with other doctors, but I would have to say that there are very good patients that who could really help me, which is that they actually they don't keep they don't okay some patient really keeps everything and they organize very well, right? That doesn't help me actually. Some I mean it does help, but it doesn't help too much because we don't have time to read it. But I do have patients they have this nice like one page or two page summary of what has happened and then the key elements and you know history because they go to different doctors and they always bring this print out to me and then show it to me actually. And so if you so I, I can't fix the electronic medical record very quickly, but I would highly recommend that you keep a nice summary of uh, uh, events or medication, allergy. Okay, you think it's on the medical record, but as you just said, it doesn't talk, so we can't see it. So, so I have patients that who brings those print out, and it really saves time and help me to you know avoid mistake actually. Dr. Ueno, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.